It's my great pleasure to uh, have with us today Marie Kaut. Uh, she is the wildlife manager in DEC Region 7, and she pointed out to me that I had said she was Region 4, and I know darn well she's not. Um, she has degrees in wildlife science from Cornell, her bachelor's from Cornell, her master's in wildlife science from Colorado State. And she's uh, been with DEC on and off since the 60s when she started as a conservation aide. And that was back when our department was called the Conservation Department. Had uh, a number of different uh, assignments in Colorado and uh, West Virginia. And she came on permanent with this agency in 1979 in the Bureau of Wildlife. And she's uh, pretty much worked across the board here at DEC. She's worked in biometrics, um, hazardous waste effects on fish and wildlife, uh, federal aid administration, fur bearers, and uh, her current position, I think she's been uh, on the order of about seven years, I'm thinking. And uh, she's in Region 7. And so uh, welcome, Marie. Thanks, and Leslie. That's a um, great introduction. Um, if anybody has any problems hearing, let me know. I'm, I'm not sure how this conference phone picks up. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is pretty much a lot of background on feral swine, both nationally and state. Um, and then I'll get into a little bit of the specifics of our eradication program here in central New York. I'm going to talk about what are they, where are they, why they're a problem, and some strategies for addressing the problem. Um, on our title slide, I, I just want to point out the list of partners that have helped. We've really got a grassroots program going here in central New York with uh, various, several uh, soil and water conservation districts, Cortland County, Onondaga County, and um, we've got the Upper Susquehanna Coalition supporting our work. And also in, on the state level, New York State Department of Ag and Markets, um, the Cornell Vet School is involved and USDA Wildlife Services. And just while I'm thinking about the credits here, this presentation was prepared by a fish and wildlife technician who works here in Region 7 uh, part-time. She's also a doctoral candidate at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. That's Wendy Balsterson. So first of all, what are feral swine? Um, they are all of the genus Suscrofa, which is the same as the domestic swine. That, that species includes feral swine, feral hogs, goes by a variety of different names. Um, the Eurasian and Russian wild boar are also in the same species, considered the same species as the domestic swine, and domestic swine were uh, descendants of the old wild boars. Um, what we see in, in different parts of the country is a lot of morphological variation depending on the source of the animals and domestic and wild crosses. Um, picture, the pictures on the left are pictures that came in from other states. The photo on the right here is uh, typical of what we see in central New York. They're really um, the wild boar stock that's been imported to the state for uh, primarily for hunting in enclosed hunting facilities. In other parts of the state, we've seen some of the, um, the pigs that look more like the ones on the left and, and are more likely to be um, of domestic origin. But in other parts of the site, state as well, they also see the, the ones that look like the Eurasian wild boar. And another thing that's important to note is that even the, the ones that look like the ones on the left after months or years in, in a wild state revert in appearance, especially if they're young, to an appearance that is more what resembles the wild boar appearance with a straight tail. And um, even I've, I've read that sometimes their faces become longer if they're, if they're young when they get out of captivity. So um, you can just see a variety of different types in the wild. Um, one thing, especially when we're considering the domestic ones, is of course what we're talking about is free-ranging um, animals of any kind without a, obvious ownership or appropriate management. Uh, 
going to talk a little bit about where they are in this slide that Wendy worked on. Uh, shows a little bit of the history of the various multiple introductions into the U.S. Uh, I just want to emphasize that point that that um, no Sioux Scrofa is native to the U.S. We had various introductions at various times for enclosed hunting facilities um, in the Northeast and in the West in Washington, uh, some of that in California. We had domestic swine imported in the early 1500s into Florida and into Texas in 1685. Um, those two little patches in um, Tennessee and um, North Carolina were for hunting purposes early in the 1900s. The photos on this, um, on this slide are uh, peccaries, um, which are not, in fact, Sioux Scrofa. They're not in the same genus as is what we're talking about here. It's a separate genus that is native, a separate family that is native in North America. And uh, what's shown there is a picture of the javelina or collared peccary on top, and then the, on the bottom, the white, uh, I think it's the white lip peccary that's, that's native in Central and South America. Of course, the collared peccary is, is native in Texas and Arizona and the Sonoran Desert as well. And one reason I want to talk about those is that we'll talk later on about the, uh, the reproduction and fecundity in the, the feral swine, the Sioux Scrofa. It's very much different in this family of Teosuidae that includes the peccaries. They have um, a, a much longer gestation period. I think it's on the order of 160 days. And um, they have a litters of, litter size of one to three. So, uh, that's a marked contrast to what we see in Sioux Grove, and I'll talk some more about that later. I want to just talk a little bit about the colors on the maps because you can't see the entire legend there. Um, at this time, and this, this uh, map is from 1982, the green was areas where there were less than 10 feral swine per square mile estimated, and the red is areas that had more than 10 feral swine per square mile. I'm going to show you a slide that's an update of that. This is a map from 2004 and, and serves as an illustration of how quickly they can expand their range. And I'm sure some of this was that people were uh, detecting and reporting them more regularly too. But you can definitely see the contrast between, between the previous map and this map. And the green in this picture is 1988. The yellow is 2004. So California is entirely filled in by 2004, and Texas is pretty completely filled in, as are many of the southeastern states. There's a little tiny blotch of yellow up in New Hampshire at this point. And we also had feral swine in New York, although we weren't aware enough of it and in tune with the problem enough to get it on this map. This map was is compiled. Um, Actually, I think the source is, it may be the Southern Wildlife Disease Center. Or it's in Athens, Georgia anyway, but it's a national map and we didn't get into it. Some states that are sort of comparable to us in, in where they are with their, um, with their infestations right now are Oregon. Um, they've got a lot of counties colored in there. It looks like quite a lot of area, but they're basically pretty small populations. And, um, Another, another one is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has several counties that are fairly heavily infested. Uh, Michigan doesn't show on this map in 2004, but they have 65 counties with uh, reported free-ranging feral swine, mostly connected with captive Eur Eurasian wild boar hunting facilities. Northeast, we've got several states that now have uh, feral swine problems. New Jersey and southern New Jersey has uh, uh, some domestic swine that were, I think, have been running around and kept out of captivity for, for quite a number of years. Um, but they, and, and a golf course became aroused about them and, and now they have a state program primarily by trying to increase the take through hunting but their, their goal is eradication, but they're trying to do it through a hunting program. Pennsylvania, as I mentioned before, has um, fairly significant numbers of feral swine, and um, they have a, a little bit different approach. They allow hunting for the most part, 
but in the in the one county right now where they have an eradication effort that's ongoing, they have restricted the hunting in order to provide more um, uh, security for the eradication program and not disrupt the eradication program. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that too at, uh, later on about why they apply that strategy. Uh, we've talked about New York and then we have New Hampshire that a couple years ago we were reporting that they thought they had uh, eradicated them and, and I think they're just sort of on the edge. Once the population densities get, get so low, it's, it's very hard to know if you've truly eradicated them or not. West Virginia, I want to point out, is a little bit of an anomaly. It doesn't say anything about it on this slide, but they actually like their wild boar and consider them a game species that they want to manage and increase. And it's, it's quite different than any other state in the Northeast. And if you look at, uh, I don't know if you can see the map very well, but down in West Virginia, there's a little green patch, and where the, and the green, I think, signifies the older uh, populations that they've had for a longer time. But those um, animals mainly subsist on is, is oak woods, elk forests and acorns, and uh, they have a problem with a lot of removal of those forests in those counties for tabletop or, or mountaintop um, strip mining, mountaintop removal, and I think that the habitat is severely degraded. There may be some other reasons, but they don't seem to get the level of reproduction that we get in the states farther up in, in central New York where we have a, a different mix of habitat types. If anybody has any questions and wants to pop in, I don't know how your system works, but I'd be willing to take questions uh, as we go through the presentation if, if anyone wants to, to do that. Hey, Marie, this, this is Leslie. We usually hold them to the end, but um, certainly if you welcome questions as you go along, that's, that's a great way to go. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't care if people want to chime in if, if your system works. Just call it to my attention that there's a question. Great. So people just jump in if you need to. Okay. Um, so in New York, it's, we've, we've known about our, our problem in central New York for a significant number of years, although we didn't realize what a problem it was. Um, our assumption was sort of that hunting would keep the numbers down. We knew we had escapes from a couple of captive um, shooting facilities here in central New York. That hunters occasionally shot feral swine in the wild, but we typically heard of adults and and um, sort of figured that, that that was taking care of the problem until a couple of years ago when I think nationally there was a lot more attention focused on feral swine and, and um, we documented that we had at least some reports of reproduction and then we decided to try and and do some some trapping and eradication. And at that that's the point where we really got young animals in hand. And that was in February of 2008, last year, we trapped um, roughly 19 animals here. It, it was exactly 19 animals. Um, we had 30 to 50 pound animals in that mix along with adults. The 30 to 50 pounders would be juveniles, probably first year animals. And at the same time, in early February, we had sows that were ready to deliver a litter. So we actually, not totally 100% um, sure that, that that was the same, the mothers of the juvenile uh, less animals less than a year old, but I would assume it was, and that we are having two litters a year from the same sows, which is not all that unusual. Um, the animal on the right is from I believe Delaware County, that's a hunter killed animal and also of the Eurasian wild boar type in close association with a sh enclosed shooting facility there. We also have some reports from uh, Washington County, uh, a group of animals observed again in the, in the vicinity of a facility that offers guided hunts for wild boar. Um, unconfirmed reports from, of a group in Allegheny County, a lone hog in Niagara County, um, Erie County. Our infestation in central New York goes um, into 
Onondaga at Cortland and Cayuga County. It's right at an area where where several counties join in Tompkins County. And we also have some animals in Tioga County associated with the population across the state line into Pennsylvania. Um, a few more records from Wayne County, St. Lawrence, Herkimer, and Essex. So it's, we've got at least individual reports of individual free-ranging swine in various parts of the state. Not all of them have breeding associated or known breeding associated with them, but it's, um, I, I guess you could say that it's fairly widespread, at least that there's feral swine roaming about on the landscape. So why are they a problem? And, and I want to talk primarily about their, their reproductive rates because they're unique among mammals in that they're freed at least twice and potentially three times a year. Their gestation period is so short, three months, three weeks, three days, as it is for domestic pigs. Um, the sows are sexually active at a fairly young age, six to eight months, and the boars are sexually active at a year. And we've seen litter sizes here of seven or eight, uh, which is a pretty significant litter size given, especially that they can breed twice a year. They have a long lifespan. Um, few predators that can effectively uh, work with them because primarily because of a behavior, behavioral characteristic that they often um, do arrange themselves in groups where there's a couple of sows, a number of sows, and, and the piglets from both sows are sort of pooled, so they've got a alt looking after the group. Um, in, in the west, in the western U.S., mountain lions can be an effective predator. Golden eagles are known to be an effective predator. I, I guess wolves could be. Um, people ask me a lot, do coyotes eat, eat them? And, and I think it's a tough, a tough thing for coyotes to do, given those two sounds. And I, my guess is that coyotes haven't learned very much that this is a good food source. And we've also seen um, um, little dwindling of, of litter sizes as we follow groups with remote cameras over time periods, uh, waiting, trying to get an opportunity to capture them. We don't see the groups being reduced. 53 a.m. Friday, March 6. To listen to the message, press zero. To skip, press pound. To return to the previous message, press star 5. To delete, press star 3. To respond, press 1. To replay the message header, press 2, 3. When a message is playing, to pause and resume, press 3. Do we know to what skip this back, is? press 5. To skip forward, press 6. To increase volume, press 4. To decrease volume, press 7. To speed up, press 9. To All participants have been muted, but you can unmute your line by pressing star 6. Marie, if you could uh, push star 6 so that we could uh, hear you again. There was some, uh, some background noise going on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't. Did you hear the last slide, Troy? Uh, no, we uh, we we lost you. Uh, somebody had their voicemail system coming on, so uh, we lost you about a minute ago. Okay. Did do I need to talk more about this slide? Um, and to let me know if I'm repeating that the sows are sexually active at a very young age, uh, two, two to three litters a year. We, we have pretty close to documenting that we've had two litters here. Yeah, I think we heard this whole slide. It was when you flipped slides that we lost you. So you want me to move forward? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Marie. We, we did cover the slide that's up now, so. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, so in addition to the, the reproductive um, potential and the fecundity, this is their, their problems that they cause are primarily related to a couple of different behaviors. One is that they're habitat and diet generalists. Um, and they, they eat any variety of, of 
stuff from roots and tubers and insects and and uh, various things in the ground to crops to uh, flesh. Um, they're efficient and effective predators on some some species. Um, but one of the main things is that they have no sweat glands, so they're tied to water and and um, Wallowing is, is typical behavior. They wallow this time of year every day and maybe several times a day. So they're in water supplies all the time. Um, and they're, they're doing all their body functions in water supplies as well as wallowing. That's huge. And a second thing is that they're rooters and so they disturb the ground and the forest floors or crops or whatever very, very significantly. Um, they also, um, another behavioral thing, they, they are in groups most of the time, at least the females and the young ones, and, um, and so they're traveling around, they're sort of spotty on the landscape and they're highly mobile. Um, they're not easily detected, it, it's really interesting because cause even as they move into an area, the landowners and agricultural community often think that the damage that they're seeing is caused by some other kind of wildlife. They don't people don't typically recognize it as feral swine damage. So we don't necessarily know when they're present on the landscape very quickly. Um, they have no problem reproducing in the, in the northern winters as we've talked about. And um, these are just some, some other biological factors. Uh, they do become nocturnal if they're pursued and, and disturbed very much and so it makes it harder to do any systematic kind of capture and removal. As far as environmental threats, um, they, they do contribute to bacterial and viral water pollution, uh, alteration of insect and microbial communities. As I mentioned with the wallowing, they cause damage to wetlands and riparian areas. And they cause soil erosion and associated problems, destroy plants, native plants, and contribute to the establishment of invasive species. And as I mentioned, they prey on anything that they can get their mouths on. It's really a wide spectrum of, of people that could be, can be affected in serious infestations and biosecurity for livestock operations is, is pretty critical. They potentially carry a lot of known diseases and parasites and some of them are very serious for livestock and transmissible to humans or people's pets. We've tested the ones that we captured here in New York. Um, USDA did some testing for us, as did Cornell, for three main diseases, that being pseudorabies, um, swine brucellosis, and classical swine fever. And so far, all the animals that we've tested have come up negative. I did hear that there was a, a case of pseudorabies in Pennsylvania discovered and Michigan has a, a very active infestation of, of a disease called pseudorabies. That's a herpes virus um, that well, well, pigs don't have such serious effects, other mammals do and it can be life threatening for dogs and cats, goats, sheep and some other species. So it's a, a serious consequence to livestock industries. Um, Water contamination, Wendy's included some examples there at the bottom of the slide of, of different things that have been found in water connected with feral swine. And feral swine were implicated in the large um, E. coli uh, problem with spinach in 2007. So potential serious problems for agriculture. As far as just the damage and the, the economic value of the damage that they do, Nationally, it's $800 million a year is the estimate. Um, they, if you look at the little chart on the bottom right there, um, rats and cats are, are um, lead the way as far as damage to, to agriculture, to crops, but feral pigs are third nationally. And that estimate is just the damage to crops. It doesn't include the um, the other impacts on livestock operations. Property damage, uh, non-agricultural is another issue and in places where they're, they're very heavily infested, Florida, 
um, Texas. There are lots of local pro programs to try and control populations just to reduce this impact for people. Um, it can be car collisions, it can be yards or golf courses or other kinds of damage through the rooting behavior. And it can also be um, some, occasionally you'll hear of attacks on humans, uh, safety threatened. They get into cities like Austin, I think the outskirts of Detroit and, and many cities in Germany have active uh, urban feral swine populations. So it's not just confined to the countryside either. So moving on a little bit from the impacts to talk about solutions. Many states, the states that have these long-standing infestations are um, in situations where they really don't have much hope of eradication. They work on control and uh, they, they take various approaches. One can be control of tr attempts to control population or more often they try to control damage from feral swine by removing. And they, there's a variety of programs in different states. Um, hunting, of course, is, is often considered to be a solution, particularly if you're in the control mode where all you care about is removing individuals. Um, generally with hunting, you can just take one animal out of a group. And if you're only looking to reduce the numbers, that's potentially a good solution. Aerial gunning is used by both state agencies in the West, Kansas is one, um, Texas, Oklahoma. And recently, um, Texas has passed or is working on legislation to allow private landowners to sell their rights to aerial gunning of feral swine, which is kind of an interesting approach. Um, but other states, I think in Oklahoma, Landowners, uh, I'm not sure. I think there's a government pro government program in Oklahoma for aerial gunning, and and there is also in Kansas. I don't see that as something we could do here in Central New York. And some states uh, allow agents uh, to trap feral swine. Texas is one. They they allow people to trap and and even sell the live ones, although they have some restrictions on who they can be sold to. But they live trap them and and donate them to food pantries, et cetera, et cetera. None of, none of those programs are long, uh, they're long-term programs, uh, for, but they're short-term solutions. They're the kinds of programs that have to be maintained forever and, and they're all costly. In, in small isolated populations like Oregon, Pennsylvania, New York, um, the, a better solution is eradication and, and not easy and not cheap, but a totally different strategy and that, that strategy involves trying to remove family groups, which of course are the, the females and the, the young females and young males in order to try and get at the, the source of the problem. And what that requires is, is sort of opposite to the control. You're not just going after any pig, you're going after those groups. And I'll get into it a little bit more, but if you think about how you have to go about doing that, you have to contain the group some way and keep them from being disturbed. And, and hunting, actually, allowing sport hunting or citizen hunting tends to fly in the face of that strategy. It's, it's not a good strategy for eradication of feral swine. So in central New York, um, we've got an active uh, trapping and removal program. It's a, it's a real, real steep learning curve, but we've, we've tried to, um, Detection is, of course, a problem, as, as I mentioned before. We've tried to get out the word. The leaflet that's shown on, on the right there where it says stop the spread is a trifold that was funded by um, Empire, Empire Chapter of Soil and of the Soil Conservation Society. I may not have that name straight, but they, they um, provided the funding for that through uh, Cortland County Soil and Water Conservation District and with some other partners, and we send that in areas, if we have a, a rumor or some anecdotal information that somebody's seen pigs or somebody's seen boars in a, in a new place, but we can't actually track down the rumor and sometimes people don't want to share information with us because they like the idea of hunting them uh, and having them on the landscape, what we often do is send that flyer out to, to the neighbors 
in the spot. We'll, we'll just pick a radius and, and send that flyer out and ask people to send us information and try to raise the awareness level. Um, we've also worked through uh, resource professionals and, and ag professionals to try and get the word out that we're interested in hearing reports of feral swine. And then once we, once we get a report, we're in touch with the people immediately to try and confirm it. And if they'll let us on their land, we're out in the field um, looking for sign, looking for wallows, looking for damage. And, and if we've got some, some indication that, that they're staying in that area, then we try to put out remote cameras, do some photography, some baiting, and then eventually uh, a trapping effort. And we're using corral traps. Right now, as is shown in the lower, the lower photo there, we also have not been successful doing it, but we've we've got some practice with using cable restraints, um, which restrain the animal until someone, one of our people, can come in and shoot it. Um, in in central New York, and probably in most areas of New York, it's always a mosaic of landowners. So we've got some public lands involved on state forests, but generally we're depending on the goodwill of landowners to let us on their property and let us do our activities. Um, I think at last count we had 13,000 acres under agreement with landowners that would let us do that. Um, our literature encourages or discourages hunters from disturbing the family groups. I don't know how effective that's going to be because Right now, currently in New York, any person with a license that's valid for small game can shoot feral swine at any time, any manner, any number, and there's considerable interest in that activity. And finally, um, we, we continue to work in the area. I've got people out on the ground virtually every day in some part of our, of our infestation looking for sign and servicing the cameras or putting out traps. Um, we've also got partners, as I mentioned before. We put in um, a grant, a terrestrial invasive species grant, to continue the program right now. It's, it's being billed, some of it, to EPF um, through our stewardship biologist. Some of it through the conservation fund, which comes from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. So that's not necessarily a good, a good match. Um, so hopefully our terrestrial invasive species grant will come through. And uh, just to give you an idea of numbers, we, we moved in 2008 through our trapping efforts, we removed 19 animals. This year so far it's um, 20, 26, 25 animals. And um, I, I think we're, so it sounds like we're working twice as fast this year. I think we're getting better at it, and it may be that the numbers are going going up some, but I don't really have a handle on the population status. I think that's um, that's about what I've got to share, um, but definitely 